OK. Mining is not a zero-sum game. This is uh, a topic that uh, we've talked about a bit. It's a bit of a change from what uh, everybody else is sort of themed on with their presentations, where we always try and over-promote every company. We always try and make sure that ours is the best. And, and you know, when we're raising money, we compare ourselves to other companies. And we, we want to make sure that we have the, you know, the number one asset. But it's really not a zero-sum game because when something happens to one company, whether it's success, whether it's a failure, whether it's an environmental, whether it's a permitting, whether it's community issues, whether it's bad results, which happens all the time, where there is an investor who doesn't understand what the results mean, you know, we all perform together. When one company is successful, particularly right now, where we have a very volatile market, we have a very uh, flat market raising money, we have a uh, group of explorers in Mexico who have a very troubled, uh, we'll say, um, time to explain what's going on with the new mining changes. We have w what I think is the best opportunity right now to sort of put our best foot forward and really lean on each other. We have companies that have been tremendously successful, like Guanajuato Silver. We have companies that are just moving along slowly. They've been working in Mexico. Ben and, and their crew, they've been here for 20 years and working in Mexico and, and have had tremendous success in developing assets, developing resources. And when we stand in front of investors, we need to recognize that that is the strength that we have. And it's not a zero-sum game. It's it's really, we are all in this together. Todos somos juntos. We need to recognize the success of our peers. Um, sometimes an investor really understands what they're you know, investing in. But a lot of the time when the market does come into more of a, uh, we'll call it a bull market, the, the generalist investor comes in and, and they're not a mining person. And this is a chart, I tried to put as many of the companies that were here today in this chart. This is a chart that just shows how we really all perform together. I've got, um, we've got uh, uh, mid-tier mining company, uh, Imperial Metals, we have all of us, and we all hit highs, we all hit lows. When the market goes, the market goes, and everybody goes up. When the market goes down, everybody goes down. This is a one-year chart. You can see that we all perform together with the gold index, with results, with, uh, you know, there's individual kind of black swan events. We had one with our Tapal asset. That can really you know, differentiate, but when the value traders come in and when the generalist investor comes in, which is what we're all hoping for right now because that is really the sign of a bull market and that's really the sign of when the industry picks up, we do all trade together and we get this question a lot when we're presenting the company, why invest in us? And the answer is really you should invest in the sector. If you believe in the sector, you should invest in the sector. I thought I would just take a moment to kind of uh, what my speculation is and whatever that's worth. Um, this kind of looks like the 2006, 2007 market. So 2006 and 2007 were really a, uh, a tremendous year for mergers and acquisitions. Some of the biggest mining companies were f sort of blending together to become what they are right now. Freeport, Phelps Dodge, Rio Tinto Alcan, Strata Falcon Bridge, Inco and Valley, BHP, WNC. They were going after these you know, huge, huge, huge mega projects and combining forces because of a rise in commodity prices from 2003 until 2006. We had massive growth in the uh, uh, commodity prices. We had a lot of rising uh, production and that gave these companies the ability to merge, put teams together, put capital resources together and really backstop their uh, dwindling resources on that production when the you know, commodity prices are high, you have production, you know, you need to replace your resources. We'll step into what's been going on for the last two years here, and you just look at that list of money that has gone into the market in this M&A space. Uh, Newmont Wrangled with 2009. Uh, Newcrest stepped into the British Columbia in a big way, $3 billion of acquisitions in British Columbia. Uh, Agnico Eagle, and Yuma uh, Agnico Eagle, Pan American Silver, teamed up with, uh, to purchase the amount of gold, Canada's largest gold mine. Uh, Kirkland Lake, Agnico Eagle, list goes on, Rio Tinto, Alchem, so that's an interesting one because it's the first big um, lithium uh, mergers and acquisition merger that we've seen that puts together uh, a major lithium um, production, well, lithium, uh, um, we'll say product production company. And then recently, of course, the Newcrest Newmont deal and then Glencore and Tech, which didn't actually go through, but we'll see what happens there. So it's a trickle down effect when these big scale mergers and acquisitions happen, 
that's when we see the market trickle down into the M&A space. And Ben will know that very well, of course, with uh, Orco Silver. But if you look at what happened in, this is a copper price chart. So $1 copper in 2005, we're at, sitting at 2020 or 2023. Even though there's these big, you know, uh, parabolic drops in the uh, commodity prices. Or, uh, commodity prices. You still have the M&A going, and you see that just general trend of the copper price going up here. So it really does signal that the growth in the industry is fueled by this mergers and acquisitions. And when the mergers happen, it is a sign and I think a leading indicator of what is going on in the market. And that's why I think right now in 2023 we're sitting at sort of that 2007 time. Even though you do have these parabolic swings you are still seeing companies uh, see that growth in their production profile with the large companies. Now, the scary thing about it, and I think that's something that really needs, everybody needs to think about, is there is oftentimes a big drop. So if you look in 2007, 2008, 2009, you had the global financial crisis. We had COVID in 2020. There is oftentimes a, you know, a, a correction that happens where we're not able to sort of, um, predict it, maybe it's a black swan event, and I think we're kind of prepping for one of those right now. And again, this is just my speculation, so um, you take it as what it is. But that M&A space that just happened in the last year and a half has been one of the biggest M&A spaces that's happened in the mining industry in the last 25 years. So what can I make up about this? <laughs> um, major M&A has traditionally been a leading indicator of you know, a period of growth for small cap companies. Historically, that trickle-down effect happens, so really a lot of us in this room are smaller companies, are, you know, sort of that $50 million market cap. It's when that major M&A comes in, you see that money just come into the market, and those generalist investors become interested. And those generalist investors are value traders. They're not looking at one particular company. They're looking at a value trade. They're looking at that chart. They're looking at this past slide that I had up here. They're looking at that value trade, and when that ticks off, that's when they get out of the market. So we need those generalist investors to come into this space, and if we can't keep them engaged, we can't actually have new influx of capital. We can't have that M&A happening on the smaller scale, and that means we're not going to have new projects developed because you know, we, we do need that, you know, influx of resource replacement. And it's not limited to the, uh, you know, big cycle. We, you know, a good project's a good project. Kinross, Redback, Bima Gold, that happened outside of the um, sort of that, you know, chart that I had with the big, uh, with the big circles on it. But we do have a large event that comes before that big push or trickle down effect into the junior space or in the smaller space and we haven't seen that yet or maybe we're seeing it right now. Um, majors are making a lot of money right now. Anybody in production is making a lot of money right now. Uh, commodity prices are at an all time high across the board, copper, gold, silver, lead, zinc. So they've been doing their homework. Uh, 10, 15 years of homework. Um, it's been a fire sale for assets right now, and we're seeing a lot of that get snapped up, much like we saw in 2006 and 2007. But if you look at the projects that are getting purchased right now, they are some of the biggest projects in the world. During flat markets, which we're currently in, access to capital is extremely challenging. Um, I just got back from a month on the road, really trying to target new audiences, trying to get that generalist investor, that new, young, uh, you know, entrepreneur, someone who's made money in the market, someone who's made money in the tech space, the cannabis space, but someone who understands what investing is. And they are coming into this space and they're showing up in this space and they're very trepidatious because they don't understand this market and they see it as kind of a, uh, almost a bull ring where we're all competing against each other for that small piece of capital, but that is all that exists right now. We're not in a major M&A cycle, or we're not in a trickle down cycle right now. We're in a major M&A cycle. We're seeing it every day. And I think we can expect a black swan event to occur where there is going to be something that does have that parabolic drop into the, you know, the nether regions of lack of capital, lack of interest, lack of general investors stepping into the space. So who needs to raise money? Everybody. Everybody in this room needs to raise money. Anybody who's an exploration company does not have revenue and you need to raise money. So let's be honest about that. So, how do you raise money and how do you prepare for this commodity bull market? These are sort of uh, some things that we've been working on with our company and it's really important for that generalist investor to have that two to five year development strategy. And that takes time. You can't just say this is our two to five year development strategy. It changes with your projects. It changes with your assets. It changes as you become aware of certain flaws in the assets. 
and you can't fall in love with your asset. Bad management can ruin a world-class asset, and good management can make money on a mediocre asset. And that's something to remember because that does open up the playing field for a lot of people in this room who are excellent explorers, excellent developers, spend money wisely. And you need to prepare a very, very well-researched and targeted marketing strategy. And I can't stress that enough. You need to know where you're going. You need to know who you're talking to. You need to know what your audience is. And you need to be able to explain to them what we're doing as a mining company because mining does have a 150 year track record of being a very dirty industry, of having you know, uh, spills, messy tailings, dam bursts, having you know, discharge. That's all projects from 65, 70 years ago. That doesn't happen anymore. And we, know, we all know this in this room. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir about that. But we know that the current status and the current environmental regulations and the current you know, ESG guidelines and the current permitting doesn't allow for those sort of messes to be left anymore. You need to communicate your two to five year plan to your current shareholders and graciously welcome feedback. These are people that are funding your company. They're the most important people. They're who you work for. And it's free to hear this information from them. If you can sit in a room and someone's going to tell you, hey, I think that this needs to be done this way, you don't necessarily have to agree with them, but it's really you know, free to listen to somebody and free to get this advice. Another thing, and this is maybe part of this uh, not a zero sum game, is that know what your peers are doing. We're all working in Mexico here. We're all having tremendous success. We're all having, you know, facing the same issues with uh, new permitting laws, new mining regulations. But also understand what your commodity space is. Understand what your jurisdiction is. Understand what type of project you have, what stage of development your peers are in, what success they've had, where they're finding financing. And know and understand what your potential exit strategies are. Don't rely on a single liquidity event for your project. That is a very risky strategy. Is it gonna be a mine? Is it gonna be a joint venture? Are you gonna bring in a strategic partner? Are you going to develop it yourself? Are you just looking to have someone come and buy out the project? Understand what that is and really do tailor your, your development strategy around that. You really need to engage with new markets. One of the most interesting things that I saw when I was in the last you know six months or a year in this marketing campaigns that we've been doing is there is a very vibrant and very engaged young new investor that is show up and showing up into this space. And what they want you to do is they want you to be different. They want you to be the same mining company that was around 50 years ago. They don't want you to just be spending your money you know, on, on a, a stupid drill hole here, just trying to drill for numbers. They, they want you to, to be something that stands out as a product that they can invest in because that's where they made their money on their last investments. That's how they made their money on the tech space, on investing in a new app. That's how they made their money on the cannabis space, investing in a new type of processing, investing in a new type of uh, solar facility. So what are some of the common sources that we're accessing capital right now? It's very difficult. It's really, really difficult to raise money right now and you have to really think outside the box. So private financing. There's private companies here. That's a, sort of a limited space. You can only have a certain amount of shareholders. You're really, there's not a lot of liquidity. Once you're in on the private deal, then you, you're kind of stuck until it goes public or you have to do a private sale. You have your public equity raises. So understanding who is raising money, who is Guanajuato Silver raising money with? Who is Oryx raising money with? Who is Discovery Silver raising money with? Who's Reina Silver raising money with? They, they're gonna understand the space a little bit more and you're gonna have a bit more of an open door. So that's understanding your peers, understanding what they're doing, understanding how are they raising money and what are they doing? Of course, you can go into a lending situation. That's really more for an advanced company, same as a forward sales contract or an offtake agreement. Ocean, Ocean Partners is in here right now, so we put them up where you have these offtake agreements. Those don't necessarily fit the bill for the smaller companies, but it's something to think about because you do need to think about that two to five year strategy. It's not what you're doing today, it's what you're doing in five years. And of course, there's royalty sales and joint ventures, strategic partnerships. All of these require fundraising and marketing campaigns. Researching and understanding your audience and establishing a budget is gonna help you tremendously in accessing these various different types of, you know, whatever financing I talked about up here, whatever group of people that are raising money or are giving you money. And knowing your audience. You really, really need to respect the knowledge of the listener. Not everybody is a mining expert. In fact, most people that are, are doing equity financings are not mining experts. They're experts in lending you money. They're experts in giving you money. And 
if you are going in there and telling them about a potassic alter this and a, a, it, it's really going to confuse them. It's going to it's going to make them sort of hesitant to uh, focus in on what you're doing because that's not where they're making money. They're making if we do this, then we do this. If we develop a big porphyry, then it's going to be a big porphyry mine, and they're probably very smart at giving you money and they want you in that room because they want to make money. So you really do need to explain to them how are they going to make money in their investment with your company. And it's your job to help your audience understand that investment opportunity. What are they investing in? How are they going to make money? And there's a few questions and this is sort of, a, a, I guess, a, a, what I've learned that helps us in our endeavors to raise money. Are you a shareholder? So you go into a meeting, you sat down with you know, the head of banking for RBC or the head of capital mar mining markets for BMO. Do you have shareholders with the company? Are they happy with the company? Is there anything that I'm talking about that you need to understand better? Slowing down and explaining to them what are we doing and making sure that they understand so that questions that you know, may be easily answered by a team of geologists aren't being confused by an uh, investment advisor, a broker, even a mining analyst who may not have as much ground experience as you. You have one opportunity and if you lose that audience, you're not gonna get them back. So also understanding what risks that you have in your investment is, or, or you have with your company is very beneficial. I found that it's a, a, a great way to engage and, and make someone feel comfortable is to go and, and tell them, hey, we're in Mexico, there's jurisdictional risks right now. In the past there wasn't, we don't know what's happening in the future, but right now there's jurisdictional risk. However, there are companies that are making a lot of money. There are companies that have built mines in two years, they put them into production and they're gonna be producing a million ounces of silver per quarter. There's not a lot of other global jurisdictions that have you know, Newmont's 20% of their gold equivalent ounces in Zacatecas, or uh, a mine that produced, uh, or a mine that's made a discovery, a world-class discovery at La Colorada, that funded purchasing Canada's largest gold mine. And this is, I can't stress this enough, get used to being told no. Get comfortable with being told no. Being told no is great. Get some criticism, find out why they said no. Just because they've said no doesn't mean that you've done something bad, doesn't mean that your investment you know, proposition is bad. It just doesn't fit, their prof uh, doesn't fit their profile, doesn't fit their fund, doesn't fit what they're looking for. Get that criticism to find out, get that follow back, get that follow up to find out why do they say no and what might, them, might make them say yes in the future. Okay, so let's say you've raised some money. Now you gotta have this wonderful game of shareholder engagement, which is um, really a team effort because everybody's got their own sort of you know, way of approaching that and there's definitely a, a lot that's changing. How do you keep your shareholders engaged? Shareholder engagement is your number one priority. Shareholder interest and, and maintaining shareholder you know, confidence is your number one role as a company because that's who you're working for, is your stakeholders and your shareholders. They're who's paying your salaries, they're who's paying the exploration work, they're, they're why we're all in this room right now. Once you lose shareholder interest, you're probably never gonna get it back. So really knowing your shareholder base, do they know Mexico, do they know, you know what we're doing here, do they know the laws of Mexico? And become a master in social media. This has been something that I didn't necessarily subscribe to you know, five years ago, and it's remarkable now how much influence social media has on the general perception and the general day-to-day -day sort of understanding or how someone feels about your company, and it, tra it causes trading. So constant communica communication through social media, through videos, podcasts, news releases, webinars, everybody's been doing them, but just keep at it, just make sure that you're constantly informing your shareholders so they understand what you're doing and they're gonna come and ask you questions. So, everybody's tired, I'm gonna wrap it up. Uh, I know I saw a lot of you last night. So, these are kind of my tips, I guess. You gotta present to your audience. You gotta make sure to take the time and ask the questions to ensure that you're being understood so that they understand what you're doing, they understand what the investment opportunity is, they understand how are they gonna make money, they understand what the timeline is, they understand what your exit strategy is, they understand what your scope of development is. And be prepared, but do not get discouraged when you be told no. 
it's an opportunity to understand you know, who's going to participate. It's going to give you criticism. It's going to teach you how to grow. It's going to make sure that you, you know, form a, a, either a, a more concise, it's going to, or a concise investment thesis, or it's going to make sure that, you know, that one thing that you were saying was really poorly understood. You get to step back and you get to look at it and say, hey, okay, I know how to go to the next person and, and make sure that they understand what this person didn't understand. I can't stress how important it is, how, I can't stress enough how important it is to be knowledgeable of your peers. Know who is doing what in the districts that you're working in, in the deposit types that you're working in, in the financings that you're doing. Know who the movers and shakers are in the industry. Know who's on the finance side, know who's on the social media side. Like, we're all in this together, as I said. We're all facing the same issues here in Mexico. But be an expert on your opportunity as well. So when someone who is your peer, when James or when Ben or when someone comes and talks to me, when Lauren comes and talks to me, I can explain to them what I'm doing because I'm a peer to them as well. I think it's really important as well to help your peers. We have a lot of negative pressure on the mining industry. We have a lot of people who are uh, have a maybe misguided opinion based on you know mines from 60, 70 years ago. And I think it's really uh, uh, an act of kindness to help your investors see what is a value opportunity in your space, but do not give someone investment advice. Do not put yourself on the line. Do not put your, you know, tr or their trust in you on the line. Just show them and, and, and say, hey, they're working in this space, they're working down there, go talk to him. Know who your peers are and get to know them so that you can trust what they're doing and you can see what they're doing, and then it does bring your investment sp space and investment circle closer together. We're not in a bull market yet. I don't know when we're going to be in a bull market, but good projects are being bought. We, HUD Bay just bought uh, Copper Mountain Mining. Agnico just stepped in on San Nicolas for a $580 million direct investment. Um, some of the largest mines, some of the largest projects in the world are being purchased in an M&A cycle right now. But because we're not in a bull market, and what we've seen over the last sort of two spikes of M&A, we've had big black swan events that have had these parabolic drops, capital preservation is key. It's not going to be easy to raise money in the mining space for the next 12, 16, 18 months. There's a lot of global stressors on, on why the commodity cycles are where they are. And that is a buying opportunity for the big major companies who, it doesn't matter for them, they're printing cash right now. Raising money during these times is super challenging. If you are doing a financing, you do need to be very strategic about how you're going to. That's understanding who your investor is, that's explaining to them clearly how they're going to make money. A lot of people who are in this space who've been in this space, not the new investors I was talking about, but a lot of people who've been in this space for a long time are very trepidatious to invest right now because they can see that a safe investment exists in these big companies right now. We're not seeing a lot of you know juniors put up big drill holes and see any sort of remarkable gains. We Gogol drilled 50 meters of a kilogram silver yesterday and they closed up 3%. And I just stress this again, all commodity cycles in the past 20 years have experienced a parabolic destructive event that eliminated the generalist investor and that generalist investor is a value trader and when those value traders show up in the space, that's when the market really takes off and that's when we see you know, that M&A space trickle down, that's when we see capital influx and when the times are good, the times are good. You can raise money, you can do work, you can get permits, you can buy new projects, you can, small companies can merge together, but that's not there right now. Right now, we are in a probably bear market still. Commodity prices are high, but we're not seeing that, you know, love from the generalist investor. We're not seeing the big trading come in. Some companies have volume, some don't. We sometimes trade 2 million shares. Yesterday, we traded 4,000 shares. Nobody is rewarding exploration success right now, so preserve your capital. So that was a bit of a you know, rant, I guess, uh, but uh, I really do thank everybody. I just wanted to make sure that everybody had a bit of a toolbox outside of just the exploration success. Um, Defiance, you know, Jen gave a talk, but uh, Windermere Capital, uh, we've got two natural resource funds. We are investing in companies right now, and OrcQuest, we're looking at everything. So anything that's interesting, please come talk to us. We love hearing new stuff.